Welcome back on the Space Info podcast. You must have seen a very special image we have shared in the past days, and we also have written an article about it. This image portrays astronaut Bruce McCandless while he is performing an untethered spacewalk. In this image you see astronauts approaching his maximum distance from the Space Shuttle Challenger, which is orbiting the Earth, and so is doing the astronaut inside the MMU, which is the manned maneuvering unit. So, what's MMU? An MMU allows the crew to move outside the cargo bay of the shuttle and performing activities away from the safety of the spacecraft, but with very particular feature, they are untethered. Maybe you're a young one and you're seeing spacecraft flying to the International Space Station and astronauts performing EVA, so extravehicular activities, but they are always tethered with a safety cable to the station itself. In this particular occasion, and only in a few others, astronauts were able to maneuver the MMU, which, as said, is a maneuvering unit which allows the astronaut to perform some maneuvers and getting away from the spacecraft that at that time was the space shuttle and performing some maneuvers completely in the freedom of space. If you have listened to our previous episode, in particular how spacecrafts dock to the space station, you know for sure how difficult it can be, particularly because a lot of counterintuitive maneuvers have to be performed in order to dock, to get closer and to move away from the space station if you are piloting an approaching spacecraft. In the same way, the spacecraft at that time was the space shuttle and the astronauts inside the MMU together orbiting around the Earth, particularly in the low Earth orbit. However, if you have to perform some relative maneuvers, moving relatively between the two entities, you have to completely understand the orbital mechanics. Indeed, until the point that on the February the 7th, 1984, astronaut Bruce McCandless II was able to perform this maneuver, it was not an easy way up to that point. First of all, a lot of agencies involved didn't approve, uh, particularly in the first instance, the maneuver because it was deemed too risky for a man to be untethered with respect to the spacecraft. But in the end, astronaut Bruce McCandless was cleared to perform his maneuver and move away completely free from the Space Shuttle Challenger. But we also remember this moment not only for the beautiful photograph that was taken with him as a subject, but also for what he said to his wife and all the mission control room when he was there. It may have been one small step for Neil, but it's a heck of a big leap for me. Let us know if you want to learn more about astronauts' lives, what they did and which are the main milestones of their lives. Let us also know if you want us to talk about biographies by just letting us know in the comments, writing a review or letting us know on the socials, particularly on Instagram and also on our website. Just tell us and we'll do it. Who was this astronaut? Who was Bruce McCandless II? For sure, he was used to live in emergency situation. Indeed, he was an American Navy officer, also an engineer and then an astronaut of NASA. Bruce McCandless II was born on June 8, 1937 in Boston, Massachusetts. He started his career in the US Navy, but was not the first in his family. In 1958, he received his Bachelor of Science from the United States Naval Academy. Then he received also a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University, but also in 1965 an MBA from the University of Houston Keogh Lake in 1987. With more than 5,200 flying hours, he flew some of the most iconic planes like the Lockheed T-33B Shooting Star, Northrop T-38 Talon and also the McDonnell Douglas F-4B Funnel 2. One of his most important accomplishments is that at his age of 28, McCandless was selected as the youngest member of NASA Astronaut Group 5. Among different space missions, he was part of the STS-41B, which is the mission that passed through history with this amazing photo we started the episode with. Now that you know a little bit of the history behind this mission, I have one question for you. Do you know that there is also a photograph of the Space Shuttle Challenger of that same mission taken from camera installed on the MMU? Do this, go look for it on the internet, that's very impressive. But maybe you've been looking at the image with Bruce McCandless as the main subject and you're asking yourself how the human body adapts to space. For sure, just a small episode of a podcast cannot answer all your questions, but we can try to give some example and give you a general idea of how the human body adapts to the space environment. First of all, during the space shuttle missions, the time spent in space for the astronauts was so small that no major effect has been observed on their bodies. But when people started to live inside the International Space Station and spending more months into space, this topic has become more relevant and a lot of studies try to understand how the human body adapts to space and which are the changes that happen inside a human 
two things which are the most evident and most important aspects of the human body are the skeletal apparatus and also the muscular system of a man and a woman living in space. Even though no major differences in the sex of the astronaut, so if he is a man or she is a woman, no major difference has been observed at least so far. This has been very useful to understand how disease and illnesses develop on Earth and give also a general understanding of how deaths can be treated here on Earth to patients suffering from major issues on their skeletal and muscular apparatuses. When you start living in space, in particular in LEO, so low Earth orbit, you are still inside the Van Allen belts, so radiation and solar particles are not the biggest problem you can have, for example if you were on a trip to Mars or also you are living prolonged time on the Moon. However, the major issues are microgravity connected. Indeed, here on Earth you are constantly under the Earth gravity, so your bones and also your muscles are trained to support that force which is constantly acting on your body but if you start living in space and you spend a lot of time in microgravity your bones and your muscles try to adapt to the new condition and basically they can become weaker which is the main reason why astronauts have to constantly train for example something like two hours per day to keep themselves fit you can observe something that also happened for astronauts on shuttle missions which is called the motion sickness this is a very short term issues that you can encounter on yourself if you were an astronaut in orbit but this usually is treated chemically with drugs and usually in a matter of hours it is over. What happens on the longer term is that your bones become weaker, so your levels of calcium in the blood and also in the bones become lower, as well as your level of nitrogen in your muscles becomes lower as well, and your muscles are weaker, and also your total mass becomes lower. And a particular effect you can observe on instruments orbiting is that your blood moves from basically your legs, as here on Earth, and completely redistributes itself on the entire body. So basically, you can observe the heads of the astronauts which can appear bigger and apart from that aesthetically fact you can suffer from intracranic pressure which is increased to give you some problems to your eyes for example and also to your eyesight basically. These are only a small part of all the issues and the illnesses that can be studied in space, particularly in microgravity condition, that can help us study them here on Earth and can be very useful for people which are sick here on Earth and can help them to be treated effectively here on Earth. Before going too deep into this topic, we conclude this episode by talking about motion sickness. If you are interested to understand how the human body adapts to microgravity condition, how the human body works in space, just let us know in the review part of this podcast. Also contact us on the social channels of the Space Info Club and on our website. Let's get back to motion sickness. We have to think that gravity provides a directional stimulus that plays an important role in life processes in the cells such as biosynthesis, membrane exchange and cell growth and development in general. Know that uh, throughout its entire evolution, each living organism on Earth, so not only the man but also all living things on the planet, has experiences a 1G environment. 1G means that the normal acceleration of Earth is basically 1G. 9.91 meters per second squared. In absence of this stimulus, or when it is reduced, you can better understand how the molecular mechanism through which the cell detects the gravity and converts this signal to a neural, ionic, hormonal or functional response. At the NASA Ames Research Center, they developed a combined application of biofeedback and autogenic therapy, which is a learned self-regulation technique that demonstrated to be quite successful in controlling symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, and it has been very useful not only in a small part of tested individuals but also on a larger group of ones. One of the most interesting approach was introduced by NASA with a pre-flight adaptation trainer, the so-called PAT. This was employed on subjects prior to flight in order to simulate the future condition of reduced gravity and pre-adapt the entire body, giving a preview of their coming conditions. And this technique demonstrated to be very promising in crew training and gave the best results. So nowadays it is partially used to adapt people before they can access the International Space Station and microgravity conditions. But now I hope that I have given you a general understanding of what does it mean to live in space, in particular in microgravity condition. Let us know if you want us to talk this topic a little more in the next episode, tell us in the review, in the comments, or let us know on our website and on our social channels. Thank you for listening to this point and see you in the next episode of the Space Info Podcast.